Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we'll be discussing tumor lysis syndrome, a life-threatening condition that we see in cancer patients. It's feasible to manage, especially when preventative measures are used and it's diagnosed fast. So normal cells and tumor cells are similar in many ways, which makes sense because tumors are simply normal cells that have mutations, causing them to divide uncontrollably. Because of this, they both have similar intracellular contents. Now, tumor lysis syndrome occurs when a lot of tumors break down and release their cell contents into the bloodstream. Two main things can cause the tumors to break down and release their contents. First is that it happens spontaneously on its own and is not triggered by chemotherapy. The exact mechanism is unknown, but previous research studies have suggested that it may be due to abnormally high temperature in the tumor cells. Second, you guessed right, chemotherapy. Because chemotherapy can cause cell death, and this usually occurs within one to three days of chemotherapy initiation. Now, the good thing is that the tumor lysis syndrome doesn't occur in every patient with cancer, but we do have factors that put patients at a higher risk. One being patients with high tumor burden. In other words, the tumor is big in size or there is a lot of it. Next, cancers with rapidly dividing cells. You may say, hey, Mr. Pharmacist Academy, I thought all cancers have rapidly dividing cells. <laughs> okay, first of all, you could call me Eric. Second of all, yes, all cancers do have rapidly dividing cells, but some are just much faster than others. So example, Burkitt's lymphoma could double in size in just 18 hours compared to prostate cancer, which can take months to years. Next, some tumors are very sensitive to chemotherapy, meaning that the response rates are higher. If the tumor is sensitive to the chemo, then obviously more tumor cells will die and release their contents. And finally, this concept also applies to the medications that are utilized. The ones with high anti-tumor activity will cause more cells to die. Example being venetoclax, a medication that we use in leukemia and lymphomas, and it has a warning for TLS in the package inserts. So how will your patients present? Well, the patients with the risk factors, we monitor them closely. So if their potassium, phosphate, or uric acid starts to increase, we should be concerned for tumor lysis. Potassium increases because it's an intracellular electrolyte, so it's released. Phosphate because when the tumor cells die, they release their DNA, which contains phosphate. So when it's broken down, it releases that phosphate. Uric acid is produced due to the metabolism of purines, which is part of the DNA that's released. These patients may also have low calcium levels due to the precipitation formed with the phosphate. Now, when things get really serious, these patients may present with more urgent complications, renal impairment, decreased urine output, increased in serum creatinine, EKG changes, and seizures. Now, because of how patients present, we can classify tumor lysis syndrome into two categories, laboratory and clinical. Now, in order for the TLS to be considered as laboratory, it must have two or more lab abnormalities and occur three days before or seven days after treatment initiation. Clinical TLS is diagnosed when laboratory TLS is accompanied by any of these. Now, what's considered an abnormal level of uric acid or potassium or phosphate to be counted towards the laboratory abnormalities? We use the Cairo Bishop criteria, and here are the cutoffs but please always follow whatever your professor provides, let's say for an exam or for classes or your institution guidelines. So one positive thing with TLS is that it can be prevented. So if you have a patient with the risk factors, you want to begin preventative therapy two to three hours before chemo. So we usually give patients hydration by mouth or IV to help clear the chemo out of their body once it's administered and improve the kidney function also. Or you want to use medications that can target the uric acid levels, which we will discuss the mechanisms next. Now for the other abnormalities, such as the hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, etc., we monitor it and manage when levels are out of range. Now, uric acid formation starts when food high in purines are consumed or when DNA is broken down and release purines. Purines are then converted to hypoxanthine and then hypoxanthine is converted into xanthine, catalyzed by xanthine oxidase 
And then xanthine makes uric acid, which is also catalyzed by the xanthine oxidase. After uric acid is formed, your body excretes it renally. So it usually converts it to a more water-soluble form known as allantoin. And this is done by the enzyme urate oxidase. Before we dive into the medications that are used, please keep in mind that we can either stop new uric acid from forming or help promote excretion of the ones that are already formed in the body. To stop new uric acid from forming, we give patients allopurinol and fiboxostat. To promote excretion of the ones that are already formed in the body, we give rasburicase, which is pretty much just like urate oxidase, so it converts uric acid to the more water-soluble form allantoin. Now for the patients who unfortunately end up developing tumor lysis syndrome, we will manage it based on how they present. For patients with hyperuricemia, we continue to hydrate them and also give agents to target the uric acid. In this case, we can do allopurinol or fiboxostat to prevent new formation of the uric acid and also add rasburicase to get rid of the ones that are already formed. Patients who present with hyperkalemia, we follow the treatment approach as we would for any type of hyperkalemia. So give agents to either excrete the potassium or shift it into the cells. Also in patients with EKG changes, calcium gluconate is utilized for cardiac stabilization. Patients with hyperphosphatemia, we have several options also. They have their own unique pros and cons. So for example, calcium acetate contains calcium and may help replenish the low calcium seen in these patients. They are affordable and readily available also. So for Savellamia, studies have found that it has an anti-inflammatory property and also reduces uric acid levels. Despite these advantages, the relatively high price and also the GI side effects are the main drawbacks for its use. Lastly, hypocalcemia which we replenish as needed, especially if this is accompanied by symptoms such as EKG changes or altered mental status. That will be the end of this video. As always, if you learned anything at all, please like, subscribe, leave questions down below in comments or feedback, and also follow me on Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.